Occasionally you get to actually live your dreams a little bit, and I try to really enjoy that because you probably aren't going to make a million movies. <laughs> uh, so it, you, know, you better enjoy the, the times that you have where, you're, where you have this amazing crew and cast and producers all kind of helping you with this dream. That's film director Rob Meyer. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Rob Meyer is a young, independent filmmaker who enjoys telling quiet stories. And so far, they happen to focus on kids who are coming of age. Meyer found his most recent film in Annie Howell's semi-autobiographical script, Little Boxes. Little Boxes tells the story of a biracial family who moves from Brooklyn to Rome, Washington. Gina, played by Melanie Linsky, is white and a photographer. Her husband, Mac, played by Nelson Ellis, is black and a writer. Their son, Clark, played by Romani Jackson, is about to start sixth grade. They make the move because Gina has been offered a tenure-track job with health insurance. So off they go to a totally white town across the country. But the reaction they incur is not hostile. It's awkward. Nobody can believe Gina would move from New York or that Mac doesn't really sound black and is a published novelist. The bookstore immediately orders his book. And Nerdy Clark? Well, he's expected to bring a whole new level of cool to the sixth grade once he learns to act a little more black. This tight-knit family finds they weren't quite prepared for the change, and they soon find themselves struggling to understand themselves and each other in their new context. And according to director Rob Meyer, Little Boxes is also about the assumptions we all make. The assumptions about different parts of the country, about different socioeconomic groups, uh, different regions, race. It's about issues of coming of age and sexuality and family dynamics all wrapped up in one family dramedy. This was the summer before Clark, who's the child in the film. It's, it's the summer before sixth grade, which is such an odd time in a kid's life. Yeah, so yeah, Clark, who's played by Imani Jackson, is I think 11 turning 12, and it's a super awkward time. You're just coming to realize who you are. You're, you're stepping outside the definition your parents gave you potentially. You're starting to have your own taste in music and culture and sports and girls or boys or you know, you're just learning who you are and yet you're in no way equipped to handle all of the things that are getting thrown at you. Uh, especially in Clark's case if you're the one biracial kid in a very white community. So he, yeah, he's up against a lot. And that was definitely the seed of the film's idea was Clark's story. It originally was much more a strict coming-of-age film about this kid. Uh, and as the script evolved, the parents became larger characters. I just want to stick with Clark for a minute, because at that age, I think it's especially hard when you have parents like his parents, like Mac and like Gina, who are kind of cool parents. Because when, you know, when you want to identify yourself, you do it by pushing away from your parents. But if your parents are kind of cool, it really puts you in a dilemma. Right. You're re you have to rebel against your super cultured, progressive, cool parents who have great taste in music and you know, already into interesting things and are not in any way boring. But he, yeah, he embraces more mainstream kind of culture that both his parents look down on. But his feeling is, well, I can make my own choices. And yeah, it's uh, definitely a period that is really fun for me to dig into. I like working with young actors. It's a very specific and short period that's so fleeting that it's interesting to me. And you basically haven't quite learned how to lie to the world in the way that we do as we get to high school and college. Gina is an academic, and that's why they've moved to uh, Rome, Washington, uh, because she got a tenure-track job. And her husband, Mac, is a writer. That's right. And there's a way in which the film sort of gently pushes against academia and mocks it, though mock is a harsh word. It's sort of I think it does. <laughs> it teases it. The film does a lot of teasing in all sorts of directions. And I certainly think Annie, who wrote the film, who is in academia, you sort of feel comfortable teasing the thing you're a part of. And so I think because she's from that world, she can embrace the occasional ridiculousness of it with the assumption that people don't take it at face value. But I think it's also a narrative device to isolate her. 
Uh, you know, she's moved her whole family out here. She hoped to join this community of academics. She'd been a struggling artist on her own, working as a photographer in, in Brooklyn and not finding her place necessarily. So I think she's looking to find her place and to discover that this may not be your crew, this may not be your group, just it ups the stakes for her and increases the dreading sense that she's made a huge mistake in, in kind of dragging her whole family and life out there. Obviously, Mac and Clark are also feeling extremely isolated in different ways. So yeah, it, it was it was partly to have some fun make poking fun of academia, which I think hopefully, you know, academia can take a joke. <laughs> They're smart people who uh, hopefully know that we're not uh, we're malicious. Yeah, well, frankly, I wouldn't hold my breath about academia taking a joke. And I speak as somebody who worked in the academy for years. But anyway. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Mac, as we said, is a writer. He's written one novel, and now he's writing um, sort of food critiques. It's one of the more bizarre choices we made. He's currently working on an article for an obscure foodie magazine about people, about YouTube personality like food bloggers from all over the world who specialize in French food specifically. So it again, it meant to poke fun at how specific and obscure and, and weird the world is getting and how connected and yet disconnected we are. So it's sort of the, the world of what you have to do to make a living as a freelance writer or blogger. Or, um, but it, it also is meant to talk about how difficult it is as a, as a writer to earn a, earn a living as a novelist. I, mean, I think almost no one really does. You have to have a kind of a side job as well. And that's where I was going because he was in the process of writing a second novel. But he has a marvelous line in the film talking to somebody in this small town who he's become friendly with, which was, I thought I made it until I found out I didn't, which I think it's an artist's dilemma. You know, you have that show and you have that movie, you have that painting, you have that book and you think, aha, I have arrived. But yes. As a filmmaker, that line definitely speaks to me. <laughs> and most filmmakers that I know, you're kind of waiting waiting to be like made. Like you'll never have to hunt for work again. Projects will just come your way and you can, you, you know, you finally can just say with a straight face, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a, you know, an in-demand feature film director. And, uh, that, you know, that does happen for some people for a period of time. But someone in film school put it to me, basically everyone's just trying to get their next gig. And if you kind of keep it in that scope, it's a little less depressing. Uh, so certainly that was something as a, I, I'm not a writer, but as a filmmaker, uh, I keep waiting for that moment to arrive. But, you know, here I am on a podcast. So this, this is it. So I've made you, it. you made it. Talking to the <laughs> National Endowment for the Arts. You're, exactly. you're, you have arrived. Yes. <laughs> now, the relationship of the family is really vital to this film. Can you tell me how you worked with the three actors? Yeah, I mean, I'll start by saying it, it is, again, it's based on Annie's family, and she has this really wonderful and specific dynamic where they're very open about everything. You know, all discussions are on the table, super loving, argumentative, opinionated, complicated, but you just love this family and you want them to succeed and you wouldn't want them to fall apart in any way. That desire of the audience to want to see this family stick through this difficult situation had to be there for the movie to work. And I have to give a lot of credit to, I mean, all the credit to the actors. Melanie Linsky, Nelson Ellis uh, are amazing. They're the best actors I've gotten to work with. I got to work with Ben Kingsley one time, so I don't want to slight Sir Ben, but I, you know, he had a small role in my first film. And this to work with both of them for the whole film was a real honor. And I learned so much from watching them work. And it's, you know, it's about the little gestures, the little uh, additional touches and looks and smiles and, you know, being physical you know, in, in just small ways, body language, those kind of intimate talks with Clark in the bedroom. I really was hoping to give the audiences the feeling that they were kind of a fly on the wall of a, a real difficult family conversation and deal with issues of budding sexuality and race and confusion and anger. You know, we filmed it also in a way that hopefully felt uncomfortably intimate in a way that might have been hard at times, but hopefully put you in, in the room with this family. You mentioned you like working with kids. Why? I mean, from a selfish point of view, I find it a lot of fun. And I'm talking about kids who are like 11, 12 and older. I, I haven't tried working with five-year-olds. That would probably be a nightmare. But uh, kids who are talented and charismatic and comfortable with themselves, basically you try to cast kids who are who are right for the part. You, you know, you're not looking for a 12-year-old Daniel Day-Lewis who can do everything. Once you cast the right kids and you give them the confidence that they're the right people for the part and that they have a lot to offer and that they just could be honest. They, they tend to deliver in ways that exceed expectations. 
Uh, and they also just make sets a lot of fun. No one gets that grumpy when there's a kid around. It, it sort of creates a joyousness on set and a sense of play that people get into film to do. But it's quickly to lose sight of that when you've been doing it for a long time. I'm curious, from the time that script arrived on your desk until you could say, OK, it's printed, we're showing it now, how long did it take to make? From, from my desk to, to where we screened it at Tribeca, I think it was about three years but it had been around in script form for four to five years prior to that, believe it or not. It started out, uh, Obama had just been elected president. Uh, the story of a biracial kid felt very relevant. And the time I screened it most recently, Trump had just been elected. It has been around for a long time, as, as most indie films are. And the reason being the typical indie film reason uh, to get the financing and the actors uh, and the director and everything aligned. It's a small miracle every time it happens. And it, uh, Jared Ian Goldman was the champion of this film. He also produced uh, Loving and the Skeleton Twins. He would not let this film go away. And I think it was a testament to him and Andy's script that it, it finally did get made. Now, were you involved in raising money too? Thank God, no. Uh, <laughs> I was a little more on my first film, which I wrote and had to basically pitch to, to investors. And, and that was a birder's guide to everything. Yes. That was my based on my graduate thesis film. Uh, and that one, yeah, blood, sweat, and tears to get every dollar of that film. And luckily it came together and it came together nicely and it had just come out and gotten a bunch of good reviews when they were looking for a director of this film. And I somehow I ended up with the script and, and I really uh, connected with it. Uh, it's a humanistic film and I love films that deal with real families and real issues and are heartbreaking and funny and moving and hard to define. I, I'd say I, I love the films of uh, Alexander Payne and I love the films of Tom McCarthy and, you know, those types of films really speak to me and are what I think are really worthwhile. The, the amount of effort that goes into making a film, I feel like, well, those are worth the effort. Hopefully they'll start conversations and connect with people. So this was that kind of script and I couldn't believe I had the good luck of getting a script that had some financing already attached to it. It didn't have the actors attached to it, but that was part of my job to hopefully come on and convince actors to come on, um, which I did my best at. I also attracted <laughs> my friend Carrie Fukunaga, who's a executive producer on the film, in hopes that he could help bring more attention to the film. And, and he was involved with True Detective, and he directed Beasts of No Nation, correct? Yep. He, he directed the whole first season of True Detective and Beasts of No Nation, and then Sin Nombre was his first feature. Um, so he, he came on and was helpful, but things shifted and back and forth and took a couple of years to finally get the pieces in place. Uh, and then we did, and we shot the whole film uh, in New York. We shot a lot up in Newburgh, uh, New York, which is has a whole budding new film industry and some new uh, sound stages. And so we were lucky to kind of find that and bring some work up there. I think they're, they're looking to become a new film destination, uh, and I can see why. And uh, yeah, and made the film here and, and premiered it at Tribeca last spring. How did you cast the film? You work with a casting director. How involved are you in the casting? Avi Kaufman cast this film and my first film, and she's a legendary casting director. She does all of Ang Lee's films and probably 10 other films that you are your favorite films. Uh, so she really led the charge, but you know, ultimately I make the choices with her on the final cast. Now, it, it's a little different when you, when you bring on your leads, Melanie Linsky, Nelson Ellis, those are people you make offers to uh, for a film, that, you know, like this, where they're such amazing actors and, and they're the reason that the financiers feel comfortable sort of, you know, green lighting the project. We just offered them the roles based on their work and their experience. Uh, same actually was, was true of Christine Taylor and Jeanine Garofalo. We were lucky to have them. They're, they're pretty big names and the, no one's getting paid much on an indie film. Uh, but then we also got great actors who came to audition because of the strength of the script and because of Melanie Linsky and Nelson Ellis and Avi and me and Carrie. So... We, we had a, a real embarrassment of riches. The hardest thing, obviously, was finding an 11 to 12-year-old biracial boy who had all the right qualities of Clark. You know, it's a pretty narrow uh, target. But A.V. called me, you know, late one night or texted me. said, you know, I found him. I found him. Check your email. Uh, and, you know, she found Armani Jackson, who is brilliant and, you know, brought a lot of pathos and innocence. And I love kids whose face you can really read into without them doing a whole lot of kind of kid acting, and he had that kind of interesting charismatic face and thoughtfulness that that character needed. And a few of the actors were fine, but most of them were, were pretty seasoned New York actors who A.V. in short time pulled together for me, and I could basically look at the best of the best and, and make my selection and work with them in the auditions. Were you able to, to rehearse with the cast? 
Honestly, not really. I mean, again, that we were still casting almost parts when we were shooting. I mean, it was that fast once we got the green light. So the actors came from different places. So they were only in New York for a day. So we had a day before we started shooting that I could work on some scenes with Melanie and Nelson and Armani. And we did a read through of the script, which was really helpful. And then you have time on set when they're lighting and you're setting up. So you you have some freedom on set. But I'm hoping someday I get a chance to uh, actually rehearse for like a week or two. That would be really cool. Do you do multiple takes? Do you do many takes? How do you typically proceed? I never really know how many takes other directors do. I do probably three to five on average. I guess four <laughs> would be my <laughs> average then. So I don't think that's very much. You know, we're, we're shooting 21 days and they're not long days because the kids can't work long hours. And you do want to do a number of setups. I, I do like working with two cameras so that conversations can flow and you can have some overlapping dialogue and you can get through more coverage more quickly and not have to have the actors repeat themselves. But, you know, you, you, every time you do a new setup, you basically have another chance to have a new take if you're not quite feeling like you're there yet. But no, I mean, there are definitely some directors out there. I think like Clint Eastwood does like one to two takes or Woody Allen. They just oh, good. All right, let's go on. I'm not quite that confident yet, uh, but I've seen directors who, uh, you know, Kubrick, who was a genius, I think did like 50 to 100. I, I think it was slightly a way to kind of torture and get under the skin and brains of his cast. But William Wyler did the same thing. Yeah, definitely. I'm not into messing with my actors, but I can see how it does get results. And what about improvising? Do you encourage it? Do you discourage it? I definitely encourage it. Uh, and I always want people to do improvising, and then I tend to uh, not like it. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, try something new. And I'm like, no, 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 stick with the script. But then I actually do think a lot of improvised stuff made it in. And when you have Janine Garofalo and some of the other actresses, especially when they're having that kind of party scene and they're just riffing. And what about the editing process? Um, I love editing. It's definitely the most creative part of filmmaking in a lot of ways because you're not dealing with external factors. And uh, I guess writing is also a creative part of filmmaking. But the shoot itself, there's so many logistics and so many things going wrong. And you're at times just feeling like you're trying to stop a disaster from happening. Uh, or these, <laughs> that's been my experience where it's just like you're running out of time and you're always feeling like you don't have enough of anything uh, whereas the edit, you kind of know what you have, and now you're just trying to make the best film you can with those materials, and you start to bring in music and sound effects and the pacing of the cuts, and I have a music background. So it, to me, it's a real pleasure. Like, I could just sit in an edit room for 12, 14 hours, and, you know, it's not exhausting. It gets exhausting by the end when you're you're banging your head against problems you've been stuck with and you can't find a solution. But the beginning, when you're finding the film and the tone, it's a really pleasurable process. And I used to edit my own shorts um, and I'm so glad I'm not anymore because you to just have one more brilliant person in this part, uh, Mark Vivis, who's edited a lot of great films to bring his perspective and ideas and to bounce and to argue and to make discoveries together. It, it's a really fun part of the process. Let me ask you this. You walk out on that set. It's the first day. And even on a small indie film, there are a lot of people and yes. they're all looking to you. OK, yes. what are we doing? Do you sort of have to? I don't know get your nerve up like okay here we go <laughs> yeah it's interesting i i kind of wish i could watch other people direct to see how they handle that i really love <laughs> makes me sound egotistical i love being in charge of a film crew i treat it a little like being a counselor at camp i know i don't feel like nervous in that situation um, but i also don't i'm not like a shouty bossy throw my weight around kind of person it's just very exhilarating to have eight to ten department heads and and 20 more people all bringing their talent and skills and passion to realizing your vision, which by the time you start shooting, you have a pretty clear sense of. I mean, I think if I went into a shoot not knowing what I wanted, it would be terrifying. But by the time you get to the, to the shoot, you've worked with the DP, the cinematographer, for weeks. You know, you've made mood boards. You've storyboarded it all out. You have a really great plan. And then it's starting to come to life, and you're seeing it on the monitor. And it's really exciting. And I, I, I said before it was like a train wreck, but it's actually a lot of fun. It's just by the end of the day, it's a train wreck because you're out of time and worried you didn't get everything. So it, it definitely is a personality type. I, I think I'm an extrovert, which helps. Um, there are definitely people for whom I think it would be literally a nightmare for them. Uh, and there are probably some great directors for whom it is a nightmare and still they still do a great job. So I think that's almost more of just like a what kind of person are you? So you even felt that kind of confidence on your first film. My first film in particular was definitely sort of an out-of-body experience when the trucks showed up and how much food we had and, you know, that we had these lights on cranes and, you know, I think we had a helicopter at one point. It definitely felt, you feel like a kid, like you can't believe you're <laughs> kind of living this 
fancy. And that, and you know, growing up, that's what I wanted to do. So, uh, and I never really considered it seriously as a career till well after college because it seems so ridiculous. Uh, but occasionally, you get to actually live your dreams a little bit, and I try to really enjoy that because you probably aren't going to make a million movies. <laughs> uh, so it, you know, you better enjoy the the times that you have where you where you have this amazing crew and cast and producers all kind of helping you with this dream. Uh, it definitely takes a certain amount of ego to think that your voice is worth hearing and worth all those people supporting you. But I think everyone's is. It's just you have to have the confidence in believing in it. You've always loved film from the time you were a kid. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say I'm a real film buff. Uh, and there are definitely many conversations where people find out I'm in film and they start referencing obscure films. And I just nod, pretending I know what they are because I don't want to uh, seem like a, an idiot. But I've always loved making films. And I, I always used to borrow my dad's like VHS camcorder to make, you know, really stupid zombie sci-fi, you know, putting gasoline on my toy cars and lighting them on fire and trying to make cool action sequences. And and then I made films in college. I played in the orchestra in college, and I made these videos for the orchestra. Again, also pretty stu- theme of my films is they were pretty stupid, uh, but they were really <laughs> fun. And I think it was in college when I was making them that I realized that I was actually pretty good at it, not not necessarily as a filmmaker, but as a person who can collaborate with a lot of different people and it's a really uh, interdisciplinary art. Uh, you have to have a good background in music, cinematography, photography, costumes, production design, working with actors, editing. You know, it, it definitely is one of the things that you really can't be just good at one thing. You need a lot, you need a lot of skills. And I, I'm always enjoying doing a lot of stuff as opposed to becoming great at one thing. So it sort of fit my personality. And just also getting the most out of people, getting motivating a crew to work in the example of independent film for very little money and to really put their all into it and to push what they think they're capable of, uh, that takes a certain amount of kind of enthusiasm and uh, appreciation and cheerleading, which I'm, I'm pretty good at. Yeah, in, in that sense, I've always liked that part of filmmaking, but I, I there are definitely people who know way more about film than me. You said that it wasn't until way after college that you thought you, in fact, would become a filmmaker. What were you going to do? What were you thinking about? Actually... I did go into making documentaries right after college. So I I did think, uh, well, maybe I want a career in telling stories. Uh, But I wasn't quite really willing to say I want to be a feature film director. And I grew up in Boston. So I, during college, got an internship working for Nova at WGBH, uh, making science documentaries. So I went to work for Nova for four years and really hit the lottery. I got to travel to Antarctica twice. And I went to Everest and I went to Egypt and I went, you know, all over the place making these kind of adventure science films. And it was, yeah, it's sort of a dream job, especially for a 20-something single person, you know, who wanted to travel after college and really learned a lot about storytelling and filmmaking and working with crews, you know, on a documentary level there. But at that point, we were shooting on 16 millimeter film and hiring really great cinematographers who got to bring on lighting, you know, and grips and gaffers. You know, it was definitely a time where you could put more money into documentaries. This is 99 I started. But I still had that bug to want to tell fictional, you know, feature film stories and, and, you know, basically be like Steven Spielberg or, you know, one of my heroes growing up. And so I thought, well, I should apply to film school. And so I applied to NYU thinking, well, NYU grad film school thinks I'm maybe capable of being a filmmaker. That would probably give me the confidence I need. And I miraculously got in and uh, had an amazing class of colleagues there. I mentioned Carrie Fukunaga and Craig Johnson and uh, Mark Kamen, who wrote Black Swan. There's 30 people, and I'd say 20 of them have made films uh, that you may have heard of at this point, so, which is un- sort of unheard of for a class because usually just a few people are able to get a feature film made. Uh, so I had a really great class that were very supportive of each other and helped each other along the way. Um, and that, yeah, that, that definitely gave me the confidence to think that I could maybe could do this. Now, Little Boxes opened up at the Tribeca Film Festival. Tell me what that experience was like for you. It was amazing. My first film also was at Tribeca, and it's always a huge opportunity for a filmmaker to be at that festival. New York is a great place for film. They'll always be sold out. You'll have lines of people waiting to get in. You'll get great press. Uh, You know, there's all these red carpets and other films with big stars coming in and doing all these interviews with Entertainment Weekly. And again, going back to the I've made it feeling, it's one of those, I, you know, I, I made I made it here. Also, the world cares. You know, it's, it's important what the world thinks. Uh, it's a well, well-regarded festival throughout the world and the industry. So people take note of the film. And, you know, you make these films. Films have gotten easier and easier to make, to be honest. You can make a really great film for not a lot of money. And with the new model of the digital distribution and streaming services, there's more people willing to invest in indie films. 
So now the challenge is getting the film seen almost is harder than, than making a film in some cases. And so having a festival like Tribeca and then having it play well there and get good reviews and get picked up, we got bought by Netflix. And then we went on and did a theatrical distribution with Gunpowder and Sky. Even though we have some big stars in our films, there's plenty of movies with stars in the films that you know no one hears about. They kind of get lost in the noise. And with a film like this or my first film, which are both gentle stories about families and people, it's not you know, Daniel Radcliffe as a as a farting corpse. You know, it, it didn't have a big hook. I'm, I'm describing Swiss Army Man in case you think I've just had a stroke. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have a big catchy premise. So you need that kind of support to get the word out. And then it's also just an ego boost as well for, for everyone involved. You know, I, I've done a lot of film festivals and I was like, you know, at a certain point, is it just about padding your ego? And my friend was like, Rob, never underestimate the importance of padding your ego <laughs> in this world. What do you like about film? Why do you do this? So many of my great experiences have been going to see movies with friends or on my own. I've just had so many moving emotional experiences watching films with people and then talking about them and thinking about them. It's just a great form of storytelling. It's, it's democratic. It's not expensive to go see a movie. It connects countries and the world together. Uh, a lot of things have been said to me by characters in movies or scenes that have struck me as profound in, in movies, you know, and I think it's a way to distill kind of the important things in life uh, when it's done well, and, or it could just be fun entertainment. But I, I hope to make movies that are profound and, and have things that and lines and moments that people think about when they're done. And what's next for you? Right now, a friend of mine who's a successful music video director and I are going to co-write and hopefully co-direct a movie that's almost a musical. I'd say it's a musical in the way that the movie once uh, was a musical. It's about a young ballet dancer and an older rock and roller having an unlikely friendship. And then I do a lot of commercial and branded content is how I sort of pay the bills. Um, and I do a series with Anthony Bourdain called Raw Craft, uh, which is a web series sponsored by Belveni Scotch. And we make short documentaries and sort of goes back to my Nova documentary days. Uh, so we make 10-minute documentaries celebrating people who make things by hand. And we've uncovered a lot of great craft people around the country. And Tony goes and meets them and discovers their craft and celebrates them and, you know, is, is normal, charismatic, hilarious, interesting self. And what's the name of it? It's called Raw Craft, R-A-W-C-R-A-F-T. It's a great gig. Uh, the, the subject's interesting. I enjoy a good scotch whiskey. You know, they, they, they sent me to Scotland to go to the distillery regularly. And uh, when you have Anthony Bourdain on set, uh, suddenly the, the lunches and the craft services suddenly gets really good. Uh, <laughs> <I bet. laughs> so the, the restaurants find out somehow and suddenly you're literally getting like Michelin star chefs and James Beard Award chefs like catering our lunches because they want to kind of come out and hang out with Tony. So it's it's a good gig. And there we'll have to leave it. Rob Meyer, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. That's the director of Little Boxes, Rob Meyer. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. The Artworks podcast is now available on iTunes. Please subscribe, and if you like us, leave us a rating. It does help people to find us. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. <laughs>